Today we're going to begin looking at the process of hermeneutics. If you remember, there's three steps of the process. Observation, interpretation, and application. The way I like to explain these is a little bit like a teenager coming home from school. When a teenager comes home from school, what's the first thing that they do? Well, one of the first things they do is open up the fridge. And so think about this teenager. They open up the fridge and they stare for a long time into the fridge. Well, what are they doing? Well, they're taking mental inventory of what ingredients are in the fridge. Once they've looked in the fridge, the second thing they do is they pull out the ingredients and make something meaningful out of it, like a sandwich. And the third thing they do is they actually eat what they've put together. Well, that's the process that we're going to be learning for interpreting the Bible. And today we're learning step one, which is observation. Step one is just looking in the fridge, opening up the passage, and slowly taking stock of what ingredients are present in the passage. In coming lessons, we're going to look at uh, the next steps, which are interpretation, which means making sense of the ingredients. And then the third step is application, which means actually eating what you've learned, internalizing it, applying it to your daily lives. So the trick about observation, and this is going to sound weird, but the trick is that you have to turn off the part of your brain that wants to make sense. At this point, all we're doing is noticing what ingredients are present in the passage. In our next lesson, we're actually going to look at how to make sense of the ingredients that are present. But in order to do that, we have to first take inventory of what is actually there. What I'm going to suggest to you today is I'm going to suggest to you some different categories of ingredients that you can look for when you're trying to do the observation step of a passage that you want to interpret. So let me go ahead and start giving you some of the categories of common things that you can look for in a given biblical passage. One category is repeated words or phrases. Often when you look at a passage, there may be one phrase or one word that is repeated over and over again. Look with me at James chapter 5, starting in verse 7. This passage says, Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord, and as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and have seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Now, when we're reading this passage carefully and looking for ingredients like repeated words and phrases, then we notice that there is an idea repeated many times in this passage, and that's the idea of patience. In verse 7, it says, patient, wait, waiting patiently. In verse 8, it says, you also be patient, establish your hearts. In verse 11, it, sa it talks about endurance, and it talks about the perseverance of Job. And so when we read this passage carefully, we realize that there is a repeated phrase, a repeated thought, which is being patient. So we need to look for repeated words and repeated phrases. Another ingredient in the fridge of the passage that we're looking at is what I'll call little grammar, grammar words. Now, that's not a very technical way of saying it. There are more technical ways like conjunctions and prepositions and particles. But for now, let's just say the little grammar words, which are the small words, that hold sentences together. Let me give you an example. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Paul says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Out is a small grammar word, and yet out is incredibly important in this passage. In fact, out is the key to understanding this verse. Why is it the key? Well, at first glance, this might sound like this is a verse teaching a works-based salvation. But when we pay attention to little grammar words, we realize that this verse does not say, work for your salvation. It says, work out your salvation. It's not that you do works to get salvation. This verse says that once you have salvation, you need to work it out. 
It's a little bit like going to the gym. You don't actually go to the gym to get muscles. You've already got the muscles. You go to the gym to work out the muscles so that they get stronger. In the same way, Paul here is not saying that we should work for salvation to get salvation. He's saying once we already have salvation by faith, then we should work it out so that it gets stronger. Another category, another type of ingredient to look for in a passage when we're doing this observation step is illustrations. Like good preachers use illustrations, the Bible constantly uses illustrations. Let me give you an example of one verse that uses three different illustrations. This is Jude verse 11. Remember Jude only has one chapter. So Jude verse 11. It's talking about false prophets and it says, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit, and have perished in the rebellion of Korah. Well, if we're going to understand this verse, we've got to observe that there are three illustrations used here. Cain, who's well known. Balaam, who's a little less known, more fa famous than Balaam, was his talking donkey. And then Korah, who a lot of people are even familiar with. So we've got to notice that. Another type of ingredient to look for in the fridge is quotes of other passages. The Bible is constantly quoting itself, and we need to notice if the passage that we're trying to interpret quotes some other passage of the Bible. Look with me in 2 Corinthians uh, verse six, chapter 6, verse 1. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Here the Apostle Paul is writing, but he quotes the book of Isaiah. Now, the Bible has ways to clue us into the fact that we're reading a quotation of another scripture. Sometimes the Bible says stuff like, as it is written, or as the prophet Jeremiah has said. In this passage, the clue is that in verse 2 it says, for he says. That's a clue that Paul is about to quote other scripture. In addition, our modern translations of the Bible also have their own ways to clue us in to the fact that we're reading a quotation. Some Bibles will put that quotation in quotations. Some Bibles will put it in italics. Some Bibles will indent it or center justify it. Most Bibles will put a little letter or a little number next to the quotation and when you look at the center column or the study notes of the Bible, at the bottom of the Bible, then you'll see that the, that the number corresponds to some scripture reference. So just pay attention that the Bible is constantly quoting other passages of the Bible. Another category of ingredient that we should be looking for as we do this observation step is geographic location. What kind of geographic locations do we have in this passage? Let me give you an example of kind of a long passage which is the temptation of Jesus. And as we go along, we're going to see that the story of the temptation of Jesus by Satan actually takes place in three geographic locations. Let's look at the passage together in Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. So notice 
that there's three different scenes in this story. There's three different geographic locations. The first was in the wilderness, which means the desert. The second was on the pinnacle of the temple in uh, Jerusalem. And the third location was on an exceedingly high mountain. If you didn't read this passage carefully, then in the past, you might have sort of thought that this whole story had happened in one location. But when we do the observation step carefully, we realize that there's actually three different geographic locations in the story. Another ingredient we should look for is characters. How many characters are there in the passage that we're looking at? And it's easy sometimes to not quite observe or spot all the characters. Let me give you an example of a story with a lot of characters. In Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, this is a story about Jesus. And it says, so he, that's character number one, Jesus, got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. Then behold, they, that's the four friends, brought to him a paralytic, that's another character, this man who was a quadriplegic, lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. And at once, some of the scribes, that's another group of characters, said within themselves, this man blasphemes. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven you or to say arise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man, that's Jesus, has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And he arose and departed to his house. Now when the multitudes, that's a new set of characters, saw it, they marveled and glorified God. I think this means God the Father, so this is a new character, who had given such power to men. So when we look at this passage, we see Jesus, the four friends, the paralytic, the scribes, the multitudes, and God the Father. Would you have noticed that if you weren't carefully doing this observation step? Another kind of ingredient to look for, another category of things that may be present in a passage, are time indicators. So look for words like after, until, then, right away, after a while. Even pay attention to the tenses of verbs. Is the verbs past tense? Is it present tense? Is it future tense? In fact, let me give you an example of a scripture, of a passage of the Bible, in which the tense of one verb is what the entire interpretation of this passage hangs on. Let's look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 29. This is a passage in which the Sadducees were confronting Jesus. And they were challenging Jesus on his theological positions and on his interpretation of Scripture. So this was sort of a hermeneutics battle. This was a battle of interpretations. And one of the things about the Sadducees is the Sadducees believed that there was no resurrection, that people would not come back from the dead in the end. Well, Jesus, of course, did believe that there was a resurrection. And so when they challenged him, he fired back. And so here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22, verse 29. Jesus was asked a question. The Sadducees gave him a hypothetical situation. And they said, let's say there was a man who was married to the woman, but the man died. And so the woman married that man's brother, but that brother died. So this woman married another one of the man's brothers. And this happened again and again until she had married seven brothers. Well, they all die. So the Sadducees asked Jesus, they said, so you tell me, Jesus, when we come back from the dead, who is that woman going to be married to? Which one of the seven brothers will she be married to? And so Jesus says in verse 29, Jesus replied, You are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. So Jesus, first of all, says, You guys don't even understand the Bible. Don't you realize that when we come back from the dead, no one will be married to each other? But then he has a question for them. In fact, he says this in verse 31. He says, but about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. 
He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Okay, Jesus' point that he's making here rests entirely on the tense of one single verb, am. Jesus' point is that when this passage was written, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have been long dead. And yet God does not say that I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The point is that there is some sense in which Isaac, Abraham, and Jacob are still alive and God is still their God. And so we got to pay attention to these time indicators and even to the tenses of verbs. Another category of ingredient to look for when we're doing the observation step are questions in the text. Often the Bible will ask a question and then answer that question. And so we need to pay attention to that. Look with me in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. The Apostle Paul has just spent chapters saying that salvation is by grace. And what that means is that salvation is not something that we can earn. It's not something we work for. It's something Jesus earned for us. It's something that Jesus did all the work on our behalf. And if we simply will repent and believe in Jesus, we can be saved. And so the Apostle Paul in Romans spent five chapters talking about that salvation is not by works. It's not something we can earn. It's something that God graciously offers to us and we receive by faith. So then Paul brings up a potential objection or a potential question that people might have. In fact, this is a question that people often ask, often ask today. They say, well, so what? So you're telling me I can just believe in Jesus and it, then it doesn't matter how I live? Are you telling me that I can just believe in Jesus and then go murder someone and I'll go to heaven? Well, Paul addresses that same question. In verse 1, he says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, that's the question. If salvation is by grace, then once you believe in Jesus, can you just go on living for the devil? Verse 2, Paul gives us the answer. Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? So Paul says, when you believe in Jesus, something happens to you. You're made new. You're made alive. And so how can us who have been made alive, it doesn't make any sense for us to go back to our old way of living. So we have to pay attention. Are there questions in the text? Another ingredient that we should be looking for is responses to something someone else said. In the Bible, they're often dialoguing with someone, maybe someone who's not even in the passage of Scripture. A good example is in Colossians chapter 2, verse 20. Here, the Apostle Paul is battling with a group of religious people called the Gnostics. And the Gnostics had a misunderstanding. They thought that anything physical was bad and anything spiritual was good. And so the Apostle Paul in the book of Colossians goes to battle with them and writes this book, this letter, fighting against their teachings. Colossians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul says, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Now, here in verse 21, he's going to quote these man-made, extra-biblical, non-biblical regulations that the Gnostics have come up with. In verse 21, he says, Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. So here, the Apostle Paul is quoting not what God says, but he's quoting what these Gnostics have said, and now he's going to answer it. Verse 22, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgences of the flesh. So these Gnostics had all sorts of man-made rules of things you weren't supposed to touch, things you weren't supposed to eat. And the Apostle Paul says, you know, these things look religious, but they don't actually help you spiritually at all. And so we need to pay attention to, in the Bible, is the passage of Scripture we're trying to interpret quoting something someone else has said? Another ingredient we should look for is unexpected surprises or things you don't understand. A good example might be Mark chapter 10, verse 17. This is the story of the young rich ruler. So let's pick it up in verse 17. 
talking about Jesus, it says, Now as he was going down the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. All right. If you've been a Christian very long, then there are two sort of surprising things in this passage. Surprising thing number one is that it sort of looks like Jesus is objecting to the fact that this young rich ruler called him good. Jesus says, why are you calling me good? Don't you know that only God is good? That's the second surprising thing in this passage is that Jesus seems to be saying, well, wait a minute, only God is good. Why are you calling me good? Well, as Christians, we know that Jesus is fully God. So why is Jesus seeming to object to being put on the same level as God? The third unexpected thing or surprise in this passage is the fact that when this man asked Jesus how to go to heaven, Jesus starts quoting the commandments. Why this is surprising is because as Christians know from reading the Bible that the way you go to heaven is not by keeping the commandments, but by believing in the only one who ever kept the commandments, Jesus. So, in just a few verses, we have three surprising things. Well, it's important at this observation step to note these unexpected surprises. Now, in the observation step, we're not solving these unexpected surprises. That waits until the interpretation step. But at this step, we at least have to notice. Okay, so today, what I've done is I've given you uh, 10 different categories of possible ingredients that might be present within the text. And so here's how you do it. When you're trying to interpret a passage of scripture, the first thing you do is you read it 10 times. Each time you look for a different one of these ingredients. The first time you look for repeated words and phrases. The second time you read the passage again, looking for little grammar words. The third time you read the passage looking for illustrations and on and on and on. If you try to keep all 10 of these ingredients in your mind when you're reading the passage, it's really hard to do. So the better way to do it is to read it multiple times and each time just look for whether or not one of these ingredients are present. Now, let me give you some tips on observation because this is actually harder than it may seem. Tip number one is spend most of your time here. Most people skip this, uh, this step way too fast because they haven't turned off the part of their mind that wants to make sense of what they're reading. We have to discipline ourselves to delay interpreting the scripture and first just notice what ingredients are actually present in the scripture. If you don't do your due diligence, if you don't do your hard work on this step, then you will not interpret the passage correctly on the next step. Let me give an illustration. My wife is a master at baking. She loves to bake. I love to eat what she bakes. She's really, really good at it. And her most famous baked good is her sugar cookies. These are famous throughout the world, I think, these, these baked sugar cookies. And she's cooked them so many times that she pretty much knows how to do it. Well, one time she just started grabbing all the ingredients out of the pantry and just started throwing them into the bowl and making the cookies. But she started so fast that she never looked into the pantry to take inventory of whether or not all the ingredients were present. So she threw in multiple ingredients and as she was throwing in the ingredients, realized that she was missing the most important ingredient of all. What do you think that is? Sugar. She was missing the sugar. You can't have cookies without sugar. And so the cookies were ruined. They could not be made into delicious tasting cookies. That's how a lot of people interpret the Bible. They open up the Bible, they start looking at a passage, and they jump too quickly to trying to make sense of the passage, and they miss some of the ingredients that are present within the passage. And so we have to force ourselves to do our hard work here, or else we are going to be in trouble when we get to the interpretation step. Okay, tip number two. You may not get everything from every category in every passage. What I mean is this. Not every passage has all 10 of these ingredients. Some passages have three of these ingredients or six of these ingredients or two of these ingredients. I've had people call me and say, Pastor Brian, I'm panicking. 
I've been looking at this passage for three hours and I can't find any questions that are in the text. And I'll say, okay, um, which text are you looking at? And so they tell me. And so I turn to that text and I look at it and I go, oh, okay, well, I can tell you why you haven't found the questions. The reason is there are no questions in this text. And so don't panic. Not every passage has all 10 of these ingredients. The last thing I will say is that right now we are just noticing these ingredients. Now, it may turn out that some of these ingredients are the key to interpreting the passage when we get to the next step. However, it may turn out that some of these ingredients, while they're important, were not sort of the determining factor key that decides the interpretation of the passage. That's okay. Don't worry about that. Right now, we're just noticing the ingredients. In the next step, we're going to see which ingredients really might end up paying dividends when you try to interpret the passage.